All right. Welcome everyone to our October YMWREA virtual luncheon. I'm Laura Jackson, the 2020 chairman of YMWREA. Uh, to begin today's luncheon, I would like to introduce Darcy Stacom, chairman and head of New York City Capital Markets at CBRE, to give today's invocation. Please welcome Darcy. Thank you, Laura, and to the YMYWREA. So today, Don Peebles was going to show you how flat the road should be for people of drive, regardless of color, race, sexual identity, or gender. Two topics have dominated 2020, one unnecessarily so, and one so endlessly overdue. COVID could have been much more contained and not battered the already disadvantaged minority population. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and many, many countless other deaths have finally brought the issue of racial equality, inequality, to the forefront. The most important thing to remember now is not to be apathetic. People are about, definitely about this, about masks and social distancing, but we cannot be about diversity. Our industry, like so many others, does not represent the community it serves. Women, despite our 51% majority in population, represent around 10% of our workforce. Minorities, I don't even have an accurate percentage. As co-head of the Rebney Diversity Committee, together with Bernard Warren of Redden Brooker, which is an affordable housing developer in Harlem, we are dedicated to a change. To date, I wanna tell you what we've accomplished. We've placed the first class of Rebney Fellows who are going through a leadership training program now with Coro. We've completed our first CUNY Project Destin summer internship project with 100 students from CUNY. And it was truly breathtaking to see what they could learn in only one month, ending in a Shark Tank style presentation where the winners went through a waterfall model to show the promoted returns. The Rebney CUNY, CUNY Executive Speaker Series of Diverse Speakers has been incredible and building skills at this point has placed more than 800 people, diverse candidates into the construction workforce. So what do we need? We need money, small to large, your own, your clients, foundations. If this was my show, I'd ask Don, hey Don. <laughs> uh, we need volunteers, seriously, to be mentors, to speak on panels, to source people that are engaged and that wanna help. And finally, we need internship opportunities because we've put 100 students already through. We wanna get them to join real estate. We know that we have 150 students going through this fall. We know we have a political mess on our hands and we want these diverse people to understand the strengths and benefits of some of the policies that are going into place without them having knowledge. I ask for this opportunity to speak to you because you are an engaged and active community of doers. And I don't want to rely, I don't want you to rely on the person to your left or right on the screen, the one above or below you on the screen. This is about you, it's about all of us. So thank you again, and Don, I look forward to what you have to say. Thank you all. Thank you, Darcy, that's great. We all need to get involved, good message. So now I would like to recognize the former chairmen that are in attendance today. So when you hear your name, please rise and imagine a stadium full of applause. Uh, our first chairman is Earl Altman, uh, Kate Coburn, Andrew Roos, Leslie Harwood, Nikki Hurriet, Dave Coppell, Greg Shanker, David Browse, Rob Fink, Bill Montana, Jonathan Tutel, Lindsay Ornstein, and Lenny Lazzarino. And now we'll turn it over to our member chair, Lauren Calandrello, who's gonna discuss the fall application process for our new members. Lauren. Hi everyone. Just wanna give a quick reminder, fall applications are due Friday, November 6th, and the fall interviews will be held on Zoom on Thursday, November 19th. Please reach out to me if you have not already, if you plan to apply this fall. As a quick reminder, you need eight, a minimum of eight events, four of them must be lunches, and you'll need four letters of recommendation from YMWREA members. Lastly, if you'd like to be set up on one of the small Zoom uh, meetings that we are setting up, please reach out to me as soon as you can because we're setting them up for next week. Thank you. And again, any other questions, please reach out. Thanks, Lauren. I love those small Zoom uh, meetings. They're so great to talk to our new members, prospective members. Uh, James Nelson, can you give us an update on the Mentor Day program? 
Sure thing. So we've had a, a busy uh, season for education, and I want to thank Lindsay Ornstein, Melissa uh, Rakoff, and Gary Curry for a great panel on the fundamentals of commercial leasing, which our mentees attended. Uh, we are, have now uh, also put out applications for the scholarship program, where we'll, we'll award at our next luncheon. And finally, for those of you who are mentors, and I wish we could extend this to the entire membership like we have done in the past, uh, but we're gonna be doing this in small groups on the afternoon of December 10th. Uh, RxR is hosting us at Pier 57, so the existing mentors and mentees will, will have a chance to meet in person. That's great. Nothing more exciting than seeing people in person. Uh, Vice Chairman Caroline Merck, uh, can you give us an update on upcoming events? Sure, thanks, Laura. Um, so we had some great events this past month. Thank you to everyone who attended our cleanup of the Lower East Side, hosted by Rob Shapiro and Michael Rutter uh, a couple Saturdays ago. It was great seeing everyone in person and we really made a big impact on that neighborhood. Um, also, thank you to everyone who uh, sponsored our first annual, our first ever fall golf outing, um, which was a huge success. We had a beautiful day and again, great Great uh, to see more people in person. In terms of some upcoming events, uh, this Thursday and Friday, we are hosting tours of the new Photograph Visca Museum down on Park Avenue South. I believe we have some openings for the Friday um, time slot. So if you would like to hear more about that, feel free to reach out to me. Um, we also have some great fitness events coming up on Friday, um, hopefully weather permitting, doing an outdoor rumble class. And then we have two Zoom fitness classes uh, coming back on October 22nd and November 10th in the evenings. Um, and then please be on the lookout for another cleanup day. This one will be in Bushwick on November 7th, a Saturday. Uh, if you didn't attend the first, it's, it really wasn't a special event. Um, so I look forward to seeing you all at uh, our upcoming events and please reach out with any questions. Thanks, Caroline. And lastly to Alex Keskel for an important message. Hi everyone. Um, I just wanted to emphasize how important it is, given that this is our last luncheon before Election Day, November 3rd, for everyone to go out and vote. Um, obviously, this is a very contentious time. There's a lot of political talk. I want to emphasize, and I think the YMWREA wants to emphasize, how much every vote matters. Please get out there, whether you vote in person or vote by mail, get out there and vote because your voice counts. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. And now, without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, our speaker today, Don Peebles, founder, chairman, and CEO of the Peebles Corporation. The Peebles Corporation is one of the country's few privately held national real estate investment and development companies with a multi-billion dollar project portfolio spanning key markets in the nation, including New York, Los Angeles, Boston, Miami, Philadelphia, Charlotte, and Washington, D.C. In an era where social responsibility, social inclusion, and making change are often seen as buzz phrases, Don Peebles is creating change and making opportunities happen in communities by leveraging his expertise and entrepreneurial skills in real estate investment and development. Don Peebles and the Peebles Corporation's uniqueness is guided by his company's own principles of affirmative development to empower women and minorities to close the wealth gap with the aim of developing not just land or buildings, but all opportunities and people also. So please join me in welcoming Don Peebles. Yay. Thanks, Don. Thank you. Uh, so um, Don is gonna be interviewed by uh, both me and James Nelson from Abbott Young, one of our governors on the board this year. Um, so let's kick it off. Uh, so Don, how has the pandemic impacted you and, and your company? Uh, what is your view of the new normal now? Well, I think that uh, the first thing obviously it's done is it's made us all have to work remotely. And uh, in some regards, that's super efficient. In other regards, it's not, and it reduces our ability to collaborate as effectively. And so we're working through that. But as a company, as you mentioned, that we're a national developer, we're operating in eight cities around the United States from coast to coast. And I travel and many of our team members travel. So working remotely has been part of our DNA for a number of years as we've expanded our company. So we've been able to navigate that, but I would say that that's one aspect. We also have several billion dollars of development projects in the in various stages of the entitlement process, the lengthy entitlement process in Los Angeles that we're rounding third on now, and, uh, and then others around the country like Boston and the Back Bay. And what we have had to do is to 
sit, uh, have our entire team re-underwrite every single deal. We're heavily focused in hospitality and residential and mixed use developments. And so we've had to look at each market and look at it differently and reevaluate the future of the hospitality sector. What are the amenities and what are the scale and sizes of our units in our uh, apartment buildings? And, uh, and, and reevaluate each of those projects um, for what we see the future of the marketplace to be. Um, and then, I mean, uh, one of the other aspects that uh, we'll get into later is that this pandemic has allowed our country to focus on some of the systemic um, structural impediments that women and African Americans confront um, as they try to advance their careers and in their pursuit of the American dream. And uh, for um, the first time, the second time in my lifetime, the first time being the 1960s, an economic agenda and an agenda on fairness is at the forefront of America. And that affects how uh, companies do business, including ours. Got it, Great. thank you. Don, th thank you again for joining us uh, with this important discussion. And you have such an incredible story and your incredible power of example. And I, I also want to put in a quick plug for your, your two books. I, I, I don't know if uh, it was mentioned in the bio, but The People's Path to Real Estate Wealth how to make money in any market and the people's principles definitely uh, worth the read. So I, I'd love to ask you about your early days. So you, you started off as an appraiser and I, I know you, you, you dabbled in some real estate investing, but you, your, your first major acquisition was in 1986 when you bought uh, a class A office building in DC. The second development was then the corporate headquarters for Amtrak. And then the 1990s, you purchased another vacant office building that was converted to a Marriott Convention Center. So can you talk about, you know, how you parlayed that and how you got your career going? Yeah, um, I've been in the real estate business, I like to say, since I was 11 years old. Um, and when I was 11 years old, I got my first job in real estate and it was the, I became a janitor cleaning my mother's brokerage office location. Um, I asked if I could, my friends and I could replace the cleaning crew so I could make up some extra money. So I got exposed to real estate very early. My mother had me at 19 years old um, and uh, she um, ended up at, after being a secretary um, and buying a home in a subdivision, saw how on the closing statement, the broker made so much money as, for doing so little work. She said, oh, I can do that too. And uh, so she went to night school and became a real estate sales agent and then ultimately a broker. She was a primary breadwinner in our household because my parents were divorced when I was five years old. But as I aged, of course, my mother and I, our, the age gap became more narrow, if you will. But I watched her in her career um, as a broker and then a mid-level executive at Fannie Mae uh, how to navigate um, the glass ceiling and everything that came with it. I mean, the um, you know, the, 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 the harassment, subtle harassment by and large, that was a standard of the day in terms of her interacting with her male bosses and how she had to put so much thought into every single thing, including how she got dressed every day. And so that focused me um, as a, 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 a person and as a business person. Initially, I was going to go to me uh, medical school and become a doctor, but I wanted to always invest in real estate as a teenager. Um, and, uh, and so when I went, I spent my last two years as a page on Capitol Hill. So I got involved in politics in my last two years of high school, I worked on the floor of the Congress. So that combination made me very focused on what I thought America should do and, what it, and how it should treat um, uh, more than half of our population. And, uh, and so from there, um, after my first year of college, I decided I didn't want to go into medicine and I decided I'd go to work in real estate. It was 1979. I went back to Washington, D.C. And, um, uh, and I was a broker, but I couldn't, I could, no one could close because interest rates were 22 plus percent. And uh, so I got into appraising. And I got into appraising, um, working for my mother initially, who would open an appraisal business, and, uh, and then ultimately uh, working for another appraisal firm as a subcontractor, and then starting my own appraisal business when I was 23. And that experience, for example, the way I got my first client was the federal government, and it was because, in part, I got the door open because of my political relationships that I built in high school. So, I, so my career from, from the very beginning was political and business. 
and I became a member of the Property Tax Appeal Board in D.C. the following year chairman. And then one day I was, I, mean, I was, I had my appraisal business. I was pretty ambitious. So I leased more office space than I thought I needed and because uh, I was going to grow. And I sublet some of it. And I sublet it to two real estate brokers, two commercial brokers. And one day one of them brought me in a deal on a site in one of the uh, poorest neighborhoods in Washington, D.C. called Anacostia. And, uh, and said, hey, my client wants, has got, uh, got this property on the market. We want to sell it. You should buy it. And I said, well, why do I want to buy a piece of the land in, in Anacostia? And then he gave me a letter signed by the mayor of Washington, D.C., committing to pre-lease 100% of the office space in a proposed building by this developer. The only catch was the developer didn't have control of the site, and the developer was haggling with this broker's client about price over $150, $150,000. So not a lot of money. And the letter was signed by the mayor of Washington, DC, who had appointed me as chairperson of the property tax appeal board and who I knew since I was 14 years old. So I figured, Hey, he says he wants to empower black entrepreneurs. This is a black community. I'm a black entrepreneur. Maybe I'll go and do this deal. So I um, uh, had met some investors who were developers who um, we were pursuing another development deal in D.C., and it didn't work out. But I called him up and said, hey, how would you like to own half of an office building pre-lease to the city of Washington, D.C. for 20 years? And, uh, and they said, great, what's the catch? And I said, oh, here's the deal, and we laid it out. So they put up all the money. They had all the expertise, and uh, or much of the expertise, and we co-developed it. I made a deal with the city to lease it to them. And I was aware, by the way, that there were two double standards, one, I was an African-American entrepreneur. I hadn't built a building before. And I was a political ally of a black mayor and an environment where the media was hyper-focused on um, scrutinizing uh, the, the, the mayor's conduct. So I, um, the deal that the other developer had offered was $22.50 per square foot triple net. And I offered $18.75 per square foot triple net. So we undercut them for a better building. And my partner said, why in the world are you doing that? It makes no sense. And I explained to them that they, we're operating in America and it's a double standard. And if I offer the same deal, they're going to say I'm inferior. I'm not as competent as a, the white developer. And, uh, and therefore, um, you know, something must be wrong. But $18.75 and, and being less expensive is, is indisputable. Well, I was wrong on that. I ended up on the front page of the Washington Post and they said that my rent my rental, the rental rate that the city was paying me was above market um, without a context. So anyway, long and short of this, we built that building, um, completed it, um, and uh, that, I started that when I was 26 years old, um, completed it when I was 28, and uh, we own that building today. The city, um, when their lease expired, they released another 10 years, and, uh, and then my son is just finishing the renovation of that building, and they're leasing it another 16 years. So um, that was the beginning of our career, my career and the beginning of our company. And, uh, and that was our first public private development deal. And as a company today, we've been involved in over $7 billion of public private developments around the country. Amazing. And I've got to just put uh, one quick footnote because this has got to be one of the most amazing deals I've ever heard of. But you were also awarded the Royal Palm in Miami, which you bought, I believe, for five and a half and then resold for $127 million. But But I know also you've shown throughout your career how to add value. So maybe just quickly talk about, you know, that project and how you were able to add value there. I mean, I've, I've always said, and I've written about this in my books, that the number one thing about business is, and whatever career you choose is being in the mix putting yourself in the mix of things and being open to when an opportunity comes because all of us are going to have opportunities across our pathways, but the ones who prosper and succeed are the ones who capitalize on the opportunity when it presents itself. So my family and I were on vacation in, in our apartment in Miami beach, um, new year's, um, uh, Eve, uh, 1995. And I was reading an article in the Miami Herald, and it was a cover story about how this rundown motel and how hot South Beach was and how this rundown motel that a developer bought for or an investor bought for $800,000 was now being marketed for $5 million. And in that article, it said it's next door to the Royal Palm Hotel that the city of Miami Beach owns and is, going, and is issuing an RFP. And they're looking for an African-American developer because the 
uh, they committed to supporting a black owned hotel to settle a tourism boycott led by the NAACP and the Urban League and others um, of Miami Dade because of the racism within the hospitality industry of that time. So I thought to myself, wow, how many African American developers are there in the country that could build this hotel? And how many of them are reading the Miami Herald? And I said, hopefully only one. And, uh, and so I called the broker um, who had gotten me my apartment and said, look, I want to go see this property called the Shorecrest Hotel. And then I want you um, the day after New Year's. And then I want you to go to the city government and get a copy of the RFP for the Royal Palm. And uh, so um, I went and the day after New Year's, so January 2nd, I went and looked at the Shorecrest Hotel and immediately began negotiating to buy that, which would give me a better chance to win the RFP. And then on the flight back, my wife and I and our young son, who was about two years old at the time, told my wife, we're going to bid on the Royal Palm. We're going to win it. And it's going to change the trajectory of our company. And let's start working on the RFP response now. And so we started drafting it on the flight back. Um, uh, and that was January 1996. By June 1996, we had won the RFP, beating out Hyatt, Ritz Carlton, and many others. Um, wasn't easy, by the way, certainly with a flight. And uh, won the rights to do that and bought the uh, Royal Palm and, and combined it with the Shorecrest, built and developed and built the Royal Palm Hotel, um, dealt with all the challenges and many others that come from construction, and, uh, and then completed it. And it opened right after 9-11. Um, and uh, we you know, stuck it out, stabilized it, and then got an unsolicited offer to sell it and, uh, and decided to sell it and move on and go and look at other things. I made a mistake selling it, though. I sold it for $128 million in round numbers. And I tried to buy it back um, in 2015 um, for uh, 180. 190 million and it sold for in the 200 million dollar area. So, um, but it was a good lesson, good opportunity. And uh, again, helped us, helped me learn that the skill set of, of competing on these public private partnerships was extremely portable and mobile. And, uh, and that was again, the next step of the get, building what we now have as a, a national development firm. That's great. The story, the, the more detailed story that you told too in your book, the, the People's Principles, it had me, I knew the ending, but it still had me on the edge of the seat. Like with all, all the work you had to do just to acquire that property, it was pretty interesting. Yeah, you know, I mean, what I, what I learned is normally there's kind of no surprises in, in politics in general since elections come up with surprises, but political decisions are made, you know, they're almost predisposed to making a decision. So I wasn't supposed to win the Royal Palm. It was a, it was a consolation prize for another company who had bid on what is now the Lowe's Hotel in Miami Beach, and they didn't win. And so this was going to be their consolation prize. And they were going to partner with a, a, a black developer, but that um, black developer wasn't going to have any meaningful role in terms of the decision making process. So anyway, it was so that so it was geared towards, um, you know, them, but no one banked on the idea of someone having the guts to go and buy the site next door and control that before winning the Royal Palm RFP. And, uh, and no one was expecting me. Um, I, by that time, had some financial resources. I was stubborn and I was accustomed to fighting hard. And so I just decided that I was going to ride it out. And I also was beginning to be a bit more media savvy. So I went to the Miami Herald. They ultimately wrote an editorial recommending our project and recommending against the other developer. Um, and so in the end of the day, it was a political process. More, We had a far better financial proposal and we we're building a far bigger hotel. But I figured I had nothing to lose because all I mean, I, they got seven bids for that hotel deal and all but one other proposed developing on both sites, the Royal Palm and the Shorecrest. The only difference was I own the Shorecrest. I figured whoever won it, I would either make them pay handsomely or block them or take over the project from them. But at the end of the day, all pathways, including the, 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 the predisposed victor, had to walk you know, through me. And so I felt pretty comfortable. And so based on that, I threw a lot more money at it as well. Got it. Great. So you mentioned politics. Uh, you know, since being a page at an early age in, in Congress, 
You're the only non-Congress member to be elected as chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. So how did you get involved and what are the key goals of the caucus currently? Well, I mean, so, so what I learned through the 1960s, I was born in 1960. So I remember Dr. King being assassinated. I remember Robert Kennedy being assassinated and my teacher crying in class. And I remember I learned what they were fighting for. And so I know and I've seen and I've been based on studies and firsthand witnessing, I have seen that every step of progress for people in this country, especially in recent history of people of color and women, that progress has come through a political process and the power of politics and regulatory environments to change how business conducts itself because business is geared towards being efficient. Politics is about fairness and about um, providing equal and fair access to um, our versions of the American dream. And we all are entitled to our versions as long as they don't interfere with others' quality of life. And so I learned the power of politics. And I learned as an African-American, um, because there, were, there was no Bob Johnson, there was no Robert Smith, both of whom were my friends, but not, there weren't any black billionaires. There weren't any black centimillionaires. Um, there were very, my, I had the good fortune in, in growing up in part in Detroit and my best friend's father was Barry Gordy, the chairman of Motown Records. And he was the biggest, you know, black business person I'd ever met or heard of. And so what I learned though, is that politics was where the power to shift and right some of the wrongs and level the playing field. And so by learning that early, um, I was able to see the combination of business and politics and, um, and then, you know, in my, in the members that I worked for in, on, in high school, which were Gus Hawkins of California, um, Charlie Rangel of New York and Ron Dellums of California and John Conyers of Michigan, they were all co-founders of the Congressional Black Caucus, which was in 13 black members of the 435 members of Congress. And today, the caucus is about 52 members of Congress. It's the largest um, voting block in the Democratic caucus. And so I chaired the caucus um, foundation, which is a think tank for the uh, Black Caucus, because they, ha they could not, when uh, there were rule changes and the Congress member couldn't take contributions to build a, you know, a, a political operation. So it became a think tank and a, and a not-for-profit. And I chaired that. Um, and I chaired it during the last two and a half years of President Obama's term and then going into early uh, Trump term. And I tried to focus the, uh, the discussion on getting the members of Congress to focus on an economic agenda for African Americans. Um, and so um, our conferences and our um, you know, legislative conference and our quarterly conferences were all themed and focused on how to include more African Americans in the pursuit of the American dream because, I mean, the disparity is just alarming. So the average household net worth of a black household in the United States is $17,000, while the average household net worth of a white household in uh, the United States is 171000 so 10 to 1. Um, so that disparity is, uh, is very large. And, or you can go to Boston, Massachusetts, where the average household net worth of a black household is $8 versus $247,000 for a white household. So those disparities make it so um, it's impossible to close a wealth gap because you can't get started. And so one of the things that I focus the caucus on was to focus on access to capital because all these real estate deals are financed in part by private equity. And, and the biggest investors in private equity are public employee pension systems and union pension systems. And they are disproportionately minority and women contributors. And the big contributors, the employees that are contributing to these retirement funds are minorities and women. But yet out of the $70 trillion in private equity and venture capital, less than 1.3% of it is invested with minorities and women, period. 1.3% of that $70 trillion. And so until we uh, provide fair and equal access to capital, um, we're not gonna see any change. And by the way, we don't have time for baby steps. And, our, and, and by the way, the business model for like our industry in New York is not sustainable um, with this kind of exclusion. And so the playing field needs to get leveled fast because the politics will shift further left. There will be less 
of a business friendly environment. And so it's in all of our best interest to accelerate that. But that's what I have the caucus, fo I had the caucus focusing on. And, and thank goodness, they're continuing to focus on that agenda now. And I think if there's a change in administrations, you'll see a rapid advancement of that agenda of economic empowerment to close a wealth gap that took 400 plus years to create in the first place. Those are incredible statistics. And in light of that, and I know this is a big reason why you announced your uh, new fund, uh, a half a billion dollars to fund uh, minority and female developers. So I, I think you already spoke to the need about this. Um, but uh, when I heard your interview at the, the Commercial Observer Power 100, you, and I really appreciated how forthright you were about the challenges and raising that fund and kind of underscores the need. So, so maybe tell everyone about the, the, this fund, the purpose of it, and, and where you are in, in the process right now in the fundraising. Okay. Well, I mean, I think we have a simple premise that we can all, I think if we're honest with each other and we're honest with ourselves. We can acknowledge that people generally do business and interact with people that they're comfortable with. And so if they don't have limited exposure, if they have limited exposure to people of diversity, then they're not gonna be comfortable with them. If they don't live in an environment where they interact every day with people of diversity, they're not gonna be comfortable. It's just not gonna be their thing. And, uh, and then if they see women um, in a subordinate way, um, or they were raised to see women in a subordinate way, then they're gonna see women in a subordinate way. So they, but the problem with all of that is that the people who deploy capital take those same um, predispositions, that same um, innate sense of exclusion, and they do business with their, their, their peers, people they're comfortable with, and they are white men by and large. And so when you look at the deployment of capital, how little of it in the real estate industry goes to African-Americans and Darcy, that's what revenue should be focusing on. One of the things, one of many things, but one of them should be that by doing business with people of diversity, that's how you create fairness. That's how you create greater diversity in the industry. So it's deploying capital when, an, uh, uh, when someone who is at CBRE, who's African-American or a woman decides that after being a CBRE or something 10 year, for 10 years, that they wanna go out and develop a building consistent with what their expertise is. But if they're a woman or a minority, they have essentially almost zero chance prior to where we are today to get capital for it, unless they have wealthy family members or wealthy friends. Um, and so we have to, so, but if a white male does it, they're going to have a far better chance of doing it. It's just that, that simple. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the white male going out and doing that. I'm just saying that it's not fair to everybody else. And so we have to change who deploys the capital. And the irony is, is that women and African-Americans can't even get access to their own money fairly because their money is what's funding these real estate deals in New York all the time. So I know that my company and I personally spend probably three times more of my time than my peers. And I have many friends who are in the development business in New York and they spend far less time raising money than I do. So instead of running my business and looking for the next great deal, I got to spend my time raising money. I get, I see how few minorities and women get access to capital. And so I decided that I should do something about it, but it wasn't my own idea. I have to give credit. It was the incoming treasurer of the state of California who a year ago when she was getting ready to take office, Fiona Ma called me and she and her deputy treasurer or incoming deputy treasurer said they wanted to see more diversity in my business, in the real estate development business. And they wanted me to look at doing an emerging developer fund. And that's how it got started. And so we are raising a fund of $500 million, a small fund uh, to provide access to capital to um, emerging women and minority real estate developers and investors. And it has been like pulling teeth to raise that money because, I mean, the big, I mean, I've gotten, I mean, one of the good things, I guess, is that we've gotten so many offers to invest in our deals, but in terms of uh, being a, willing to um, invest in emerging women and minorities, I mean, it's been harder, but we're getting there. And, uh, but the goal is, is to build a platform, which we're gonna do, um, providing capital to people who unfairly have been obstructed from gaining it, 
who are super talented, who are hardworking and creative and giving them the capital resources to begin to go and become real estate developers and build their business. And I believe that that is a tremendously profitable platform. And I want to prove that by making these investments. And so I'm dedicating a big part of my life and my career to doing that. I mean, I've never been, I mean, as much as, you know, I've, I've done well financially, that wasn't my goal as a young man or a young boy. My goal was to knock down the barriers that my mother had to fight and confront every day or the limitations imposed on my father and my grandparents. And so now I'm able to do that. And that was one of the reasons I was considering running for mayor of New York City, not because I want to run New York City, not because I have some political dreams, but I see the system so innately unfair and that New York City can't figure out how to do more than two, three percent of its business with minorities and women combined and women of 53 percent of New York City's population. And Darcy, just for your information, minorities represent 69 percent of New York City's population, and it's growing. So the fact that you have all these people and they're not getting a fair shake. And so I'm using this fund to prove that that is good business and um, and that you can make a lot of money by providing capital to talented entrepreneurs. And, you know, and I think the, the good example of that is what JP Morgan Chase just announced. They're going to do $30 billion worth of business with African-Americans, for example. So anyway, that's what the purpose of the fund is. It's much more than making money because, you know, we, you know, we our projects are bigger than the size of the fund. It's about being transformative and somebody has to do it. And I can't, come up on talk, discussions like this and, and, and point out how unfair the system is if I don't do something about it. And so um, I have a daughter who's 17 years old and I would love for her to, have, to be able to emerge in the world that I had dreamed for her to have. And I know that the world that I dreamt for her to have when she was born and all through her childhood is not there yet. And so I'm gonna do my part for the rest of my life to make sure it's better. And I'm gonna do it through business and through entrepreneurship like this fund. Fantastic, thank you. Sure. That's amazing. I, I would, is there, is there more we can, we could do as an organization to help, to help you and your cause and to, just to help in general? Yeah, I think that what is important is to, for everyone to understand this. I used to be, Darcy, I don't know if you're aware of this, I was on the Board of Governors of Revenue when I first came to New York in 2011. And Steve Spinola was chair, was a, a president of Revenue. And, uh, and I used to emphasize how this business model that we have in New York that I'm seeing was not sustainable. That in the long run, there would be assaults to our business, that there would, be, there would be no way the politicians would be able to continue to support such an inclusionary, exclusionary business, and Mike Bloomberg's not gonna be mayor forever. And, when some, and so you're not gonna be able to buy your way through this, but I mean, it fell on deaf ears. And the reality is, is that the, if you look at the real estate business as a whole, it is almost as unpopular as being used car sales. And the reality is, is that landlords a bad word. Many politicians now don't want to take our money. And that's because we have not been inclusive. But so that's an assault on the business model that we have. So what we can and what you can do, Laura, and what the organization can do and everyone listening is to say, look, we want a fair system. We want a system that our goal isn't that we have 20 percent women in you know, positions of management or, or the like. Our goal isn't that we're gonna have 10% of minority, minorities. The goal is, is that ultimately this business ought to be representative and reflective of the population demographics. I find it unconscionable that if women are 53% of the population of New York City, that they shouldn't be, that shouldn't be reflective of our lo biggest local industry. So I think that it starts with, you want fair access to capital. Everybody should have the dream. I mean, think about this. There are guys in the real estate business owning and building, um, you know, billion dollar buildings who are taxi cab um, dispatchers. I mean, there is no limit if you are a white male, but you try to find a woman that makes that jump. You try to find an African-American that makes that jump. And this industry should provide that ability to everyone else. And the only way that happens is fair access to capital and fair access to opportunity. And 
all of us men, most like many of us are going to have daughters one day if we don't. And we're going to want a different world for them. And we are, many of us will fall in love and marry someone of a different race or religious background. And we're going to want to have goals for our children. So this is an issue that is the most pressing issue in this country. And it needs to be fair for our industry. So what you all can do is say you want to see fair deployment of capital. I think you ought to educate the audiences and, and people about um, how capital is deployed, where it comes from, and then educating people about voting. Because the controller of the state of New York, who is the sole trustee of the second largest pension system in the country, that sole trustee can make the sole decision on where capital is deployed, is an elected official. The controller of the city of New York, Scott Stringer, is an elected official who now is running for mayor. So in the end of the day, we need to be engaged and align our interests. And women should not accept these limitations that are imposed on them. It's unfair. And, it, and, we, and, and men, we shouldn't allow anyone that we know or any of our peers, and God forbid any of us, to impede their, their ability to pursue their goals and their dreams as far as they can take them. And we should make sure that they're working in an environment where they're treated equally and that they're comfortable. And the same thing goes with African Americans and so and other minorities, but African Americans in general. And let's not lose sight, by the way, that it was 249 years of slavery with the free labor that from black people that built this country. And so, and then another hundred years of oppression um, and low wages that help further our economy. And so as a result of that, I mean, this systemic discrimination has impact, but black people did help build this country and fought in every war as well. And so we all need to be treated fairly. So I think that's it. the overriding theme is that not, we cannot look at women, and it's not done as much to women as it is to African-Americans. We can't look at African-Americans in business or in commerce as a philanthropic effort. It's not. It's business. So you should expect people to be confident. We should look to identify confidence, but we should take people under our wing just like we take, you know, the, the, le the, the less competent, you know, um, white males under our wing as well. And if we do that, then we'll have a better city. And by the way, that's the way New York comes back, Darcy. It isn't going to come back like it is now. And I mean, and, and, and we need everybody vested in it. But I mean, that means about simply just committing that we're going to expect fairness. And that's what you can do. And then all of us have to look at how we do business with each other and get out of our comfort zone. Yeah. Educate. Yeah. I mean, I happen to be, I mean, I was very fortunate because the breadwinner in my home was my mother. Um, the entrepreneur in my home was my mother. My father was a, um, a file clerk for the federal government and a part-time auto mechanic. So I learned entrepreneurship from a woman. I'm accustomed to seeing women in leadership positions. And I mean, I was fortunate by that. I mean, I was obviously sad to have divorced parents, but I was fortunate to see that. And so, but we have to change how we view our fellow um, human beings and our, and our counterparts and counterparties in this business. But talent, which we all hear, it's hard to find. Well, no, it's not. It's just where you're looking it's harder to find because you're excluding a majority of the population. And I, and I think that's how we change things. And if Revenue really wants to change things, then every single one of their members and every one of the board of governors ought to have an African-American or two and a woman in senior management. That's how you change things um, and start mentor and start teaching them or going and backing them on their first deal, being their angel investor, um, because that's how we're going to change this. So that's, uh, that's how you can help, Laura. Thank you. That's helpful. It's hard to follow up that powerful message with any question, but um, I am very curious about some of the projects you're working on now. So James, I think you were gonna ask about Angel's Landing and some of the, the current projects in the works. Sure, so Don, you've uh, invested and have projects going right now in DC, Boston, Philly, Miami, uh, New York and Charlotte, and, and including uh, Angel's Landing, which I, I believe is uh, planned to be the, the tallest uh, residential tower in the Western hemisphere. So. Uh, yeah, we'd, we'd love to hear about some of the top projects that you have going on, but then also what are the markets that you're targeting now and what are you looking to build there? Okay, I'll start from the northern tip. So we're in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm in the Back Bay. 
um, across the bridge from Cambridge. Um, and we are redeveloping a project that's on top of the Heinz uh, uh, Metro station and uh, building an overpass over the turnpike. It's one of three projects that are building, uh, that are a part building on overpass. We have land and we're building an overpass there. And that, that is a mixed use development with residential and either it was hospitality, but we're reevaluating. Re It'll likely be life sciences office. The market there is very strong in many, in certain sectors. So for example, life sciences, there's a current demand for about three and a half million square feet, but a inventory of under 500,000 square feet. So that's a very attractive space to be in. Uh, the residential market continues to hold its own there. Um, and, uh, and, and, and uh, they have, um, you know, uh, uh, been a more pro-business, more stabilizing uh, political environment. And so you can see that within the economy. The one thing that Boston struggles with, which, which I touched on, is that wealth disparity, $8 versus 247000 And these are statistics from the Federal Reserve study on income and wealth inequality. So I'd say Boston is, I mean, I'm very upbeat about Boston. Um, I think New York is in for some difficult time. There was a big run up um, on, on prices um, post 9-11 and, uh, and then the pro-business environment that Mike Bloomberg created um, and the massive investments um, from the Bloomberg administration and the state of New York under Como and, and before that Pataki. So you had this, these steroids injected into the real estate market in New York. And so New York became more and more of a rich person's city. You were either rich or you were struggling or poor. Um, and, uh, and so that ran up prices to these absurd numbers, $13,000 a square foot for an apartment. Um, someone spending 200 plus million dollars for an apartment. I mean, no one should spend that. And, uh, and so, uh, I mean, so, and so you had this, ex this expansion of wealth disparity. So I, I, but there's an oversupply of residential condos across the board. And so the only way to compete now is on price. And there are few buyers um, because of remote working, like it or not, and because of um, people able to pursue quality of life. So people are in the Hamptons, Westchester, Connecticut, et cetera. Um, so I see that New York is going to struggle on the residential side. There is a record amount of sublet space on the marketplace. I think about 16 million square feet, some absurd number like that. Um, and more to come. Um, the co-working environment uh, uh, businesses are all essentially insolvent and will unlikely survive in any remote way in their current form. So I think office is going to struggle for a while. The hospitality sector, which was nearly impossible to make money in New York because of the union contracts and the high operating cost. Um, is a dead industry by and large. I mean, clearly people are going to keep coming to New York. I mean, and the government tried to fight it off with Airbnb and so forth by attacking Airbnb. Um, but at the end of the day, there's going to be a change in the hospitality market. Many of these hotels are not going to reopen. A quarter to half will probably not reopen. And so New York is going to get, as Darcy pointed out, um, more affordable. That's a good thing, a very good thing, because it'll bring back the creative class and not make it the money class. I mean, it was becoming the Monte Carlo of, you know, urban cities. So I, mean, I think New York is going to be opportunistic at some point. There'll be a lot of transactions, but I mean, it'd be hard to develop something into this market and other than affordable housing and workforce housing. And there will need to be some solutions for that. South Florida, Charlotte, for example, we have 18 acres in Charlotte. We're building a dozen buildings. Phase one is seven buildings. Um, we are in entitlement on that, just about done. Um, we've, we're going to master develop and sell off three to four sites and develop, you know, um, three, you know, uh, of ours. Um, and, uh, and, and that's coming along very well. We're, the market is very robust, even in COVID. They've done multi-million uh, square foot leases. Um, it's the second largest banking center in the country. Cost of living, cost of doing business is very attractive. So it'll continue to be competitive, competitive and grow. Good quality of life, kind of mild winters and a little hot in the summer. And then South Florida, um, super business friendly, um, zero state income taxes, close proximity to New York, good quality of life. And that market is booming. But it's booming, interestingly, on the single family side. The single family side of South Florida, Palm Beach County, um, Broward County, which is Fort Lauderdale, and Miami-Dade County are all prospering 
on every sector of the housing market from the entry level housing market, mid market, luxury and ultra luxury sales market. In fact, so much so that we're now entering the single family business. My wife is leading a home renovation business in, in, in Palm Beach and we have uh, a couple pilot projects there, but we t intend to develop um, in Palm Beach on the single family side. And then I see, um, so, and then the office market in Miami um, was doing very well uh, pre-COVID, slowed down, but I think it comes back because of, and in South Florida in general, because of the relocation from New Yorkers. High net worth New Yorkers are not going to come, many of them are not gonna come back and be New York residents. They're gonna be Florida residents. And then there's uh, California, and in spite of high taxes, um, California is recovering over 30% of Los Angeles, of, of Metro Los Angeles, um, office workers are back at work, um, compared to a little over 10% in New York, for example, and California will, you'll see, you, you're seeing transactions on the ultra luxury side on the housing market and single family market is doing pretty well there. And we, the multifamily market is doing surprisingly well there. And what they offer though, is an amazing quality of life overall. And so we see that market as, you know, very strong. We're going to, for us as a company, the next target area for us is the back, uh, the, is, a, is a Bay Area of, of the San Francisco, Oakland Bay Area, mainly the East Bay on the Oakland side. We see some, some real opportunities there. And then a bit more north in the state like Stockton and Sacramento. And we're looking at those markets as well. Um, we think that the opportunities going forward for the for immediate future and foreseeable future will be places where um, they're offering strong qualities of life and pro business environments and um, where the communities have a good strong workforce, but there's great there's diversity. And so that's what we're, we're seeing more of a trend there. Great. Thank you. Um, I have a question for you about uh, mentoring did you have a mentor that has guided you through your career um any advice for people starting out i, I see some some comments in the chat about people starting out in real estate any advice on getting a mentor and that relationship yeah so so the mentor word has been in my view overused and i don't think properly utilized so we're business people real estate's a business and the real estate industry is comprised of business people so the mentoring needs to be done based on a reciprocal business relationship. So give you an example, the mayor of Washington, D.C. Without him, I would not be here today. But that relationship was um, he was, as an African-American man, he was committed to providing ac economic opportunities for people of color. And at the same hand, he was a politician running for office. So I had given him, I guess I must've been 21, 22. I'd given him a series of um, uh, fundraisers and receptions. And so I was, a, I was valuable to him too. And we built a relationship by me doing business with him in a way that would be helpful to him and him doing business with me in a way that would be helpful to me. And, uh, and so in real estate, I began to, have mentors, um, but it was, I brought something to the table. I maybe brought access to politicians, to the mayor. Um, I may have been able to advise them on how to get their property assessments um, reduced, um, but, or I may have brought them a real estate deal. So I think that the way you, I tell people all the time when they call me and say, hey, can you mentor me? I said, well, you can read my books and that's why I wrote them. And I'm working on a third one now. And that'll give you a sense of kind of all I know in terms of what I think is valuable. Um, but if you want to be mentored by me, bring me a deal, find me a real estate deal. And that's what I would say to anyone else. That's how, um, you know, generally young white men uh, get mentored is they bring something of value to their mentor. And, uh, and so bring a real estate deal. Uh, or some other element to the equation, but that's how you learn. You learn from, some, and I learned from other people by doing business. And when I was a teenager, obviously, I still worked on capital and I actually did work, but I got mentored by people who saw a young person who was, you know, you know, interesting, but I would approach people and so forth. So I think it's a part of a reciprocal relationship because you're building a long-term business relationship and you want to build that. We're kind of looking eye to eye 
And I think that this idea of philanthropy, when it comes to minorities, the power dynamic is so unbalanced. Um, I'm giving you something, so you better be grateful for it. And I think it's better to have relationships that are eye to eye. I think that they are more effective overall and it trains people to think differently. So I would say that if you want to get mentored or you want to get started in the real estate business, find a deal. By the way, we all know there's no shortage of capital. There's shortages of places to deploy capital. The only thing is, is that we just got to get the capital deployers to look at women and minorities as viable people to invest in. And if we get them to do that, then, um, you know, then I think we can, you know, make, you know, a lot of inroads, but that's where mentoring comes in. And that's where I think, you know, the mentoring should go is about doing business with each other. And, uh, and then understanding that someone may be learning and you teach them about the deal they brought you or about an idea they bought you and you give them feedback there. So that's how we mentor people. They come and bring me deals um, that are, um, you know, interesting deals or may not be interesting deals. And we'll underwrite them and our team will explain to them, you know, why it works and why it doesn't. And that's an educational and mentoring process. Or if it's a good deal and we, and it's not for us, we introduce them to somebody that it is for. So that's a better way. Um, you know, at least that's what I've found. Fantastic. I, I really appreciate that, that mentoring has got to be a, a two-way street. I know we've got a lot of mentees on, on this uh, Zoom as well. So great advice. Um, so Laura, I know we've got a lot of questions from the audience. So, so my, my last question, um, and it, it goes to timing, and you wrote this in 2008, just uh, on the brink of the, you know, the last you know, financial uh, collapse. And, you, and you, you said, my best real estate investments have always been opportunistic based on challenging market conditions. If you want to be successful in real estate, you have to look for the opportunities within the challenge. Buy when fewer people are buying and sell when fewer people are selling. So with, with that in mind, would you take your advice from, from 2008 is, is now uh, a buying opportunity? Um, it's beginning to be one. Um, I think that, you know, we have, I mean, we've tried to do in a good market, we've been opportunistic. I mean, the Boston Back Bay, we're building over a turnpike. I mean, so we're creating a bigger site by building a platform over a freeway, um, if you will, right in the heart of Boston. And uh, so that's, you know, so that's buying when fewer people are, for example. Um, but I think now there, I mean, there's, we're, there's, there's, people are so upside down. There's so much capital. And we're now beginning to see um, the impact of uh, COVID on businesses that were structurally unsound pre-COVID. So for example, in Washington, D.C., Mother Gallery, which was built in the 1980s as a ultra luxury shopping center in Washington, D.C., in the most, one of the most affluent neighborhoods with Neiman Marcus, Saks, and so forth there and top jewelers, it went to foreclosure um, recently at you know a quarter of what its value once was and about half of what was uh, the last transaction as it went spiraled down. Um, hotels are now getting foreclosed on. So I think there's certain sectors where there's opportunity. I think that there's still some hope and optimism, say in a place like New York City, I believe that people are holding on, believing that these buyers for the condos are going to come back, and every day the uh, real deal or, or biz now has a little trickle of a story. Twenty million dollar transaction happens and the like. So the other, you know, two thousand units or that are on the market in that price point or whatever, people say, okay, we can hold on longer. So I think it's going to take a few more months for reality to set in, and then there will be some tremendous buying opportunities in different sectors. I think the fear that will slow things down a bit is people won't understand where the bottom is. It'll be like diving into this, you know, um, pool that's got murky water and no signage as to how deep, you know, the, the pool is. You won't know whether you hit the bottom or not. So, but yeah, we're gonna definitely be opportunistic, but our business model is large scale public private deals. We'll be opportunistic through our fund. I would love to see some women decide that they're going to go out on their own or some, uh, some African-Americans to go out on their own or who got fired um, or laid off because of COVID to see some opportunity to bring them to our fund so we can back them and start changing, you know, the face of what the industry looks like. So that's where our opportunistic plays are going to be. And, uh, and then hopefully when we start, you know, when we do fund two and three, 
I mean, we're going to have a group of sponsors that we're comfortable with and the deals that we get in that may not be for us, we're going to hand off to our sponsors too. But I think that's where, I mean, this is an opportunity and I think, and I want to, the women um, and uh, the minorities that are listening to this, especially women and African Americans who are listening to this, this is a time to be opportunistic for your careers. There is going to be shakeup in our industry. You're going to see reductions in force. You're going to see, you know, people get, you know, you know, replaced. But this is a time of opportunity. This is your moment, and your moment. This moment, you're going to be at the forefront of a, of a transformative change in this country. And now, and those who are first, um, you know, are going to be rewarded for it. It'll be a little harder, but you're going to be rewarded for it. And now's the time to invest in yourself. Take your chance now, because their real estate's going to be cheap. There's an abundance of capital. Capital's cheap. they are at zero interest rates. Now's the time. Take the chance. Now pursue your dream. If you've ever had a dream of being a developer or a real estate owner or an entrepreneur, now is your moment. And now you should take it. Incredibly inspiring. Laura, we, we've got tons of questions and, and you've got some big fans that are uh, chatting in from, from Charlotte uh, and uh, talking about um, they, they, they appreciate everything that you're doing there for the, the community. Um, some of the questions I'm seeing, Laurent Connolly is asking, would you start with a, a small development uh, to get into the, the game and also getting some questions if, if your fund is, is ready for seeing some deals now if, if, if there's some opportunities out there. Okay, so twofold. One, um, our fund is um, not ready to take deals, but um, a couple of our investors are willing to do certain deals that we find very compelling. Um, and, uh, and then we'll buy them from our investors when the fund starts its closings, which will, you know, should be the first quarter of 2021. Um, and, uh, and then on the other side, about what deals to do, I'm a big thinker. And so the first building I did, you know, I didn't even own my own home, by the way, when I did my first development deal. Um, my first development deal was a 100,000 square foot office building. And that's a decent sized building. Um, and so I thought big. And I think that somebody who's already in the real estate business, who's already got some experience, ought to be thinking a bit more beyond their comfort zone. And, I, and the way I grew up my company is every deal was beyond my comfort zone. It was bigger than the next one. And, uh, and so I think you should, it's the, but it's the deal. It's finding the best deal, but the more money, the bigger the deal in certain markets like New York, for example, used to be the bigger the deal, the easier it is to get finance. I mean, you know, I got a $500 million deal finance, you know, in a short period of time and you, you'll struggle to get a $50 million deal finance. Um, so, I mean, I think you'd think, I mean, as big as the deal will present the opportunity, but realistic. I mean, you can't go out first deal and buy, a billion dollar building. Perfect. So, someone wants to know, you mentioned uh, running for mayor in New York. I think you, you have at least one vote here. Uh, would you consider running for public office, maybe in New York, other where? Other where? Uh, highly unlikely. I mean, I think that, um, you know, uh, my role, I think I can do it um, well, hopefully, is to continue to build our buildings. I mean, we have a pipeline of $4 billion of projects right now, and we're committed to 35% um, minority and women-owned business inclusion. Um, so the mathematics on that is a billion, almost a billion and a half dollars of contracting opportunities. So we can change a bit of the, the, the environment doing that, and then the fund that we're doing, and I wanna do more of those, and I believe that I'll be able to streamline. I mean, my only interest, I mean, only interest, in politics was to level the playing field for women and minorities, uh, because I do believe that our system is unfair. And, uh, and so, but I believe I can do it as a business person. And I hope that as a developer, my little company, relatively speaking, if we can do these things in terms of economic inclusion, why can't the big real estate New York, New York developers or the big ones in LA or the big ones in Charlotte, why can't they do it? Um, and that's, so that's more of where I see my role um, right now. And then you never know. Um, but it is unlikely that I would run for mayor of New York. Certainly, I can't imagine doing it um, on this cycle. 
KJ Lee, uh, who's a big fan of yours and, and uh, your book, asks for some advice you would give someone in their 20s in how to go about networking, and, and especially now in this virtual world that, that we live in, I'd, I'd add. I, I mean, I think that doing the things that we're doing now, but we're going to get back to a more normalized um, setting. Um, but I think you can network through email more, more often than anything else for me. Um, you know, when people want to interact with me, it's much more effective to send me an email or go on Instagram. I mean, I make it a policy um, of every day of the business week. I either have a email communication or a telephone call or a meeting with an aspiring entrepreneur um, of any race or gender, um, but heavily bent towards, you know, women and minorities. Um, to meet with them and talk to them about their careers. And so you can network that way. And those are more lasting um, kind of discussions anyway. So I think you got to do that, but also looking for the deals. I mean, I think that's the best way to network is look for a deal and then go try to get it done. And then you're going to be talking to a lot of different people. Great. And Gary Curry asks about uh, the future of development in New York City. And I know you mentioned uh, affordable and, and workforce. So, so how do we make more affordable housing possible? I think that we've got to look at, I mean, one, the first thing is that land prices are declining because, and they're declining rapidly because of the declining prices of the high-end condos. And so, two, I think we've got to have comprehensive rezoning in a much more aggressive way. It's a New York's a heavily uh, in, in a dense city, and so as a result of that, we've got to in, uh, incentivize and in, increase zoning um, in, um, for all neighborhoods, by and large, other than those that are single-family oriented for affordable housing but, and workforce housing. But we've got to deploy. The government has to look at providing um, greater subsidy and greater financial incentives for market rate developers to, um, you know, build affordable housing. This whole idea of for example, of, of, of doing affordable housing by giving, you know, an additional 20 percent, 30 percent floor area ratio. If you build 20 to 30 percent of um, affordable housing isn't overly compelling because all you're doing is kind of keeping the status quo. The way that I tried to get this mayor to do this when he first came into office, you change the zoning and say, OK, we're going to give you an extra three FAR for market rate housing if you build three FAR of, of, of affordable housing or workforce housing. And we're gonna give you that zoning bonus too. So you're gonna get a, a zoning bonus of six FAR. And that way you get the developer financially incentive. I mean, this is a capitalistic democracy. The pillars of our democracy are capitalism. Real estate is one of the true capitalistic businesses and we incentivize capitalism and capitalism conduct with money and financial incentives. And so they did that. That's the way to do it. There's no other, and then the other thing is reduce the demand for it. The way you reduce the demand for it, because by the way, the demand for affordable housing and, um, is heavily female and minorities. So we include more females and minorities into the workforce and start closing this wealth and income gap, and there won't be as much pressure. And that's why I say the business model of the status quo is not sustainable because it's too costly. More and more people need social services, financial support, more and more people need affordable housing. So that's how I see the solution for affordable housing, a couple of areas. Great. Well, one last, before we wrap up, we're getting a bunch of questions on how, how people can reach you with deals. How do, how do they get into this, uh, the fund and, and present a good deal to you? So they can um, uh, go to either info um, at peoplescorp.com or to me, Don Peebles at peeblescorp.com. I'm a very accessible person. I'm a big believer that I should be on the ground and in the mix. And so I have never tried to insulate myself. I mean, I think that's part of the problem of our business leaders and entrepreneurs is they kind of take pride in insulation. I want to, I don't want to be insulated. I want to be in the mix of things. So they can feel free to email me and I'll get back to them. It may take a few days, but I'll, I'll get back to them. So that's Don Peebles at peeblescorp.com. Great. Well, thank you so much, Don. This is really educational and uh, inspiring. I feel like I want to present you a deal sometime soon and uh, access some of that fun capital. So thank you for being here. Great. Please do. <laughs> and, 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 and I say that with all seriousness. Please. That's great. 
Um, for everyone, uh, YMWREA, our next luncheon is November 10th. So we'll see you all virtually on November 10th. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Don. Thank you.